Hi everyone, thanks for taking the time to come along here today. I'm Ian Wager, I'm a senior air and noise scientist working in the chemistry department at SEPA and I've been involved with much of the noise monitoring work SEPA have carried out in the past few years. Uh, and today I'm going to introduce how we at SEPA monitor noise at the Moss Moran complex. In my presentation, I'll initially outline the roles and responsibilities of the various public agencies in relation to noise, vibration, light and health. The rest of the presentation, I'll focus on the noise and vibration monitoring work carried out by SEPA. I'll explain what SEPA mean when we're talking about sound, noise and vibration. Then I'll go on to talk about flaring at the Moss Moran complex and some of the other sources of noise and vibration in the area. I'll discuss how noise and vibration is regulated by SEPA at the complex and what factors we look at to assess whether the site is compliant, including how we currently measure the flaring noise and assess its impact. So in terms of the roles and responsibilities of the various public agencies, SEPA regulates noise and vibration emissions from sites that are permitted under the Pollution Prevention and Control Regulations, that's the PPC regulations, but we have no powers to regulate light emissions. Fife Council as the local authority regulates what is termed statutory nuisance, which includes noise, vibration and light. In practice, this means that they regulate noise issues which aren't covered by the PPC permit conditions issued and enforced by SEPA. NHS Fife's Public Health Department is responsible for the protection and improvement of their population's health and health care, which means that they are the most appropriate agency to discuss the health effects associated with noise, vibration and light. So as mentioned earlier, I'll be focusing specifically on sound, noise and vibration. So how do we measure sound? Well, simplistically, sound is energy that travels in waves through the air and can be heard. On the slide, you can see an animation of a sound source vibrating and emitting sound. The vibrations bump into nearby air molecules, which in turn bump into their neighbours, and so the sound waves spread out. Our human ears and microphones respond to the changes in air pressure caused by the sound waves. And the level of sound is measured in decibels, or A-weighted decibels, which is the same scale but adjusted to account for the response of our human ears. To help you get a feel for the decibel scale, I've included a few examples. So a normal conversation, imagine you were stood in front of me just now, um, is about 50 to 60 decibels. A quiet office might be around 45 decibels, and a bedroom at night might be 35 decibels or less. Standing by a busy road might be 70 to 80 decibels, and a busy restaurant or pub might be as much as 80 to 90 decibels, although I'm not sure if any of us can remember what one of those is. And what about changes in sound level? How do we register these? Well, a three decibel change can be detected by the ear under normal conditions. A five decibel change is clearly noticeable. A 10 decibel increase, say from 50 to 60 decibels, we perceive as about twice as loud. A 20 decibel increase is about four times as loud. Once airborne, sound travels, but its loudness reduces with the distance from the source as it spreads out through the absorption by the air itself. Higher frequency sounds like whistles and whines are absorbed more than lower frequency sounds like rumbles and booms. And that's why low rumbles and bass from distant music can sometimes be audible when the higher frequencies don't reach you. It's also important to understand that sound waves travelling in the air are also greatly affected by the weather, especially wind and the temperature. For instance, sound waves travelling downwind can carry much further. It's also important to understand that certain weather conditions, such as wind and rain, are themselves sources of sound, or should I say noise. So what do we perceive as noise? Well, noise is very much related to our own human response. That is to say, how we perceive the sound. We perceive different sounds in different ways. For instance, even though they might be of a similar sound level, we may find the sound of traffic, aircraft or industry far more annoying than the equivalent sound coming from birdsong, rivers 
or wind blowing through the trees. Sounds have certain characteristics which can make them more pleasant or more annoying. Tones, clatters, bangs and rapid changes in sound all tend to make a sound more noticeable and often more annoying. This is why when we carry out our noise assessments, we take account of these characteristics. And what about vibration? How does this differ from noise and sound? When we're discussing vibrations within houses from an external source, there are broadly speaking two types. Ground-born, which travels directly through the ground and into a house's structure through its foundations, and airborne, which is sound in the air interacting with our homes. When sound waves encounter a house, some low frequency sounds can cause vibrations. SEPA don't routinely measure vibration in housing. We analyse the frequencies within the sounds we measure to look for those low frequency sounds which can cause vibration. So if I've explained myself well enough, you'll hopefully have a bit of an understanding of what SEPA mean when we're discussing sound, noise and vibration. But how does this relate to the Moss Moran flare? The elevated flare at Moss Moran is a safety feature of the site which burns off excess gas when there's a disruption in the process. The combustion of the gas causes a rumbling, roaring noise and the accompanying steam injection, which is used to prevent the formation of dark smoke, is characterised by a jet engine-like noise. Both of these are potentially sources of noise and to some extent vibration. The flare stack is 100 metres high and therefore when it's flaring, the sound created radiates out in all directions. This also means that there's a direct line of sight to many of the nearby houses with little or nothing in the way to help reduce the sound other than the distance. At lower flaring rates, the distance between the site's flare and any nearby housing is generally enough to make sure that the noise is at an acceptable level. But at higher flaring rates, the flaring noise can have a greater impact, especially at night or during certain weather conditions. It's also important to note that there are many other sources of noise around the Moss Moran area, including road traffic, especially on the A92, trains, aircraft and general urban and neighbourhood noise. There are also other more periodic sources, such as farming and agriculture, building and construction work, wind turbines and motor racing. These other sources contribute to the overall sound level of the area, which is to be considered when assessing the impact of noise from the Moss Moran site. The sources of vibration are fewer. Vibration might come from passing heavy vehicles like buses and lorries, trains passing by on the railways, or nearby construction works. So we understand that the flare at Moss Moran is a source of noise, but we also know that there are many other sources contributing to the overall sound level. So bearing this in mind, how do we know what level of noise is acceptable from the flaring? The environmental regulations allow for chemical plants to operate provided they meet the requirements of those regulations. There's a condition in both the Fife Ethylene Plant and Fife Natural Gas Liquids Plant permits, which requires that the operators, one, apply best available techniques to prevent noise and vibration emissions, and two, to ensure that significant pollution due to noise and vibration is not caused. SEPA's inspection and noise monitoring programmes are designed to assess compliance with this noise condition in the permit. At some sites, a noise limit is stated in the permit, which means that there's a sound level measured in decibels that should not be breached. Setting numeric noise limits like this at nearby housing, however, is not always practical or the best approach to regulating industrial noise, particularly where there are other sources of noise, such as busy roads. A numeric noise limit is also not always necessary and might not be the simplest way to assess compliance or the impact on the local community. Where it is practical to set a noise limit, a large amount of data is needed to understand the local noise environment and to determine an enforceable limit. Whatever noise conditions we include in a permit, on some occasions, people may be able to hear noise that is still compliant. So how does SEPA assess noise? When assessing noise, SEPA consider a number of factors in order to decide if best available techniques are being used and to assess whether any significant pollution is occurring. These factors include noise measurements, observations by staff in the community or at monitoring locations, on-site inspections, desktop inspections and additional information such as the length of any flaring event. 
Let's take the recent Fife ethylene plant startup in July as an example of what we do when we measure and assess noise. First, we ensure that our assessments are carried out correctly using appropriately qualified and experienced noise specialist staff using calibrated sound level meters. We carry out our monitoring at people's houses, at community locations, or at some other suitable locations closer to the site. These other suitable locations might not be close to the community, but they're chosen to best reflect any impact on the community. We can monitor the noise by either unattended or attended means, and in July we did both of these. First, let me explain what we mean by the term unattended measurements. Unattended means that the monitoring equipment is left running continuously, but there isn't a noise scientist in attendance to make observations. SEPA currently have two unattended sound level meters with weather stations deployed at community locations in Loch Gelly and Little Wraith. Here's a photo of our setup in Loch Gelly. The sound level meters are set up to continuously measure sound levels and to take audio recordings. This allows our noise scientists to listen back and analyse where required in order to investigate any noise complaints we might receive. And what are attended measurements? Well, during periods of planned or unplanned elevated flaring, SEPA noise scientists also attend community locations to assess the impact of the flaring noise in person. This is a more flexible approach because they can visit the most affected areas. Where possible, we carry out this work at night as it's a more sensitive time because of the risk of sleep disturbances, but we do also undertake daytime assessments where appropriate. When we arrive at a monitoring location, we're using all our senses to take in the situation. But primarily, we're concerned with establishing whether the flaring is audible, and if it is, then how audible and how distinctive. If flaring is audible, and we consider that the flaring noise may be causing an adverse impact, we can quantify the impact using a British standard called BS4142. This British standard uses outdoor sound levels to assess the likely effects of industrial sound on people both inside and outside their homes. It's the most appropriate standard for assessing industrial sound levels, and it's used by all of the UK's environment agencies. There are other standards available which can be used for other purposes. For instance, where we need to assess low frequency sounds, we can use NANR45, which is a procedure for the assessment of low frequency noise complaints. When we're undertaking a BS4142 assessment, we measure the sound level with the flare on and again with the flare off. This allows us to calculate the sound level coming from the flare on its own. If necessary, we then add on a penalty for any of those previously mentioned characteristics such as tones, bangs or distinctive noises which can make the sound more noticeable or annoying. We then compare this combined figure with the background sound level, which is typical at the monitoring location when there's no flaring and when it's generally quiet, to arrive at an overall level of impact. So how do we decide if the noise from the site is compliant? As the previous slide showed, BS4142 allows us to use our measurements and observations to quantify the impact of flaring noise. The assessed impact helps SEPA to make the decision as to whether the noise is causing significant pollution and whether the site is compliant. This decision is also informed by other factors, such as the time of day that the noise occurred, the duration of the noise, and whether any disturbance was caused. So I've discussed how we at SEPA currently monitor noise and vibration from flaring at Musmorin, and how that monitoring can be used to assess compliance. I hope I've also managed to convey how seriously we take this matter, and now I'd like to hand you back to begin our conversation on noise and vibration monitoring.